Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rachit. Uh, welcome to this session. We'll be, I'll be presenting on this topic of running design patterns for AIML workloads on Kubernetes. Uh, I work for Oracle Cloud, uh, specifically uh, Big Data Service, where we offer 20 plus different open source components like Spark, Hive, Hadoop, Flink, Kafka as a service. Uh, there are different flavors to the service available. Some run in managed offering and some as a cluster as a service. Uh, that's what I do. I also term myself as a conference traveler. I present uh, different topics in technology of big data as well as Kubernetes and containers. Uh, this is my third time visiting Australia. Uh, I, it's a really beautiful city, Melbourne. Uh, so I really enjoy it here. So in this talk, uh, we'll cover how a typical AI ML pipeline looks like, how it has evolved over a period of time, what are the different design patterns which I, uh, we have seen evolving over a period of time. So I am into this offering this uh, big data service as a cloud offering in, from last 12 plus years. And we have learned about a few of these patterns uh, which we are reusing for our newer services in the domain of security, performance, uh, storage, networking, and monitoring and logging. So I, I'll be sharing uh, our experience with you. So let's try to understand uh, how a typical AI ML pipeline looks like. Uh, there are different stages to this pipeline. It all starts with a capturing stage where your data will be coming from different sources. It could be coming from some database source or a TCP port, or uh, it could be coming from some uh, Kafka topic or even from a file from your laptop. So there are hundreds of sources where your data will be coming from. First thing you will do is to ingest. While ingesting, you will be taking care of some of the things like handling null checks, doing some type conversions, and then you'll be storing it in a persistent store, typically like uh, uh, object storage or a data warehouse. And then you will have some compute engines, which is our analyze stage, which will read this data, which is stored in a persistent store, to start building your AI models and start uh, uh, coming up with some models, which will be used by your visualization layer or some chatbots, which will be uh, uh, running against that AI models, which are deployed, and some you'll, or you'll be building some dashboards out of it. So these are the typical stages of an AI ML pipeline. And if you look towards the architecture of that pipeline, you can divide it into two parts. The uh, one is a streaming part, and one is for a batch. So you, you will uh, have a, a streaming applications which will again be uh, ingesting from source, but uh, instead of persisting them, they will be directly some stream processing engines which will be consuming that data and giving you a live feed uh, or the analytical output to it. And whereas there is a batch layer uh, which usually runs uh, over a, a period of, let's say, um, once in a day, a few hours, a weekly or a monthly, uh, so there are different characteristics to that batch pipeline versus a streaming pipeline. And if you try to map the open source stack to this architecture, you will see uh, for typically for ingestion, you will either use Kafka or equivalents for streaming part. And for batch, you will have something like a DCP or a, 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 a flume kind of thing to ingest. And uh, for your persistence, you'll use uh, object storage, you'll use warehouses, uh, or you'll use uh, traditional storage like SDFS or HPS to persist. And then you'll have different category of engines uh, for your stream. You'll have Flink, or for your batch, you have different options like Spark, Hive, uh, Trino, or Presto to do uh, querying on your data which is stored. 
And you'll, on for the visualized stage, you'll have different options. You can use uh, Jupyter Notebooks for uh, doing data engineering or data science. Uh, you can use uh, some chatbots, uh, which should be uh, basically relying on the models which are deployed. And, or you can build some dashboards or use some tools like Splunk to get more insights from this data. And today, it is possible to run this entire stack on Kubernetes. And uh, to do that, uh, there are some patterns which have evolved, which we are going to talk in this talk. So you may ask, like, what are the benefits I may get uh, by running this entire workload on Kubernetes? It has been a question uh, which I've been asked seven to eight years back. That's why I wrote that blog. Uh, it's a blog I published in 2018, but still a relevant question. Uh, so with Kubernetes, the key benefit which you will get is the ecosystem which it comes along with it. You get out-of-box integrations to your logging systems, to monitoring systems, and uh, other uh, systems which you can start reaping benefits out of the box without writing much of the code. Other benefit is on the, your cost optimization, which comes, let's say you are using Kubernetes already uh, for your, uh, some microservices workload. And now you are in a stage that you can start running your analytical workloads on the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so that you will save the cost, overall cost, required for run, running your uh, compute, because you are using the Kubernetes as your resource manager for multiple things, not just microservices, not just analytical workloads, all put together. So let's say if you're not doing on Kubernetes, uh, but you still need to offer to your enterprise these different open source stack or your AIML pipeline you need to run, what are the different options? Uh, so one option which is very popular is to uh, get uh, a cluster which has all these stacks deployed on one single cluster, which I often call it as big data cluster. Uh, uh, so that certainly works for many organizations. They are already doing that in, in production and on-premise. But there are some problems with that, is that the performance is not very consistent. They do get uh, problems like, my query was taking two hours today, but it suddenly start taking three hours, four hours. How, why is it happening? They start getting into the problems like, uh, if multiple teams are using the same cluster for doing, uh, uh, running different types of queries or different types of workloads, one team may start conflicting with other teams' class paths. So at the runtime, they see class not found exceptions, uh, which could be very easily mitigated if they have a proper secluded environment for each and every team. There will be certain issues with your compliance. Uh, you will not be able to get your certifications in certain scenarios if you're using one uh, common infrastructure. And there are obviously uh, a single point of failure and the HA requirements which you have to meet for your running your production workload. What happens if your entire cluster goes down and uh, uh, what is your disaster service uh, recovery story for that? The second very common option for running this AIML workload has evolved is function as a service. Many of the cloud providers do offer uh, it as a solution. It works very well for if you don't have the problem of scale, if you're looking for a single node kind of environment for running your service, this is a very good option. Uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you're not looking at a certain scale that you are okay to run your workloads in certain boundaries, which are offered by this function as a service, uh, in terms of uh, CPU utilization, or in terms of uh, uh, your memory utilization and the time constraints, because all this serverless model comes with those constraints, and if you are okay to uh, live within that constraints, this is certainly a very good option. So over a period of time, your teams will start learning that containers is the way to go. So they try to containerize this solution and try to run the containers on their own on their infrastructure, but they have to start building 
a container management solutions on top of it. They will need to manage the life cycle of their containers on their own. They have to manage the provisioning of the uh, uh, volumes and mount it on the containers and make sure if container uh, dies, it spins up somewhere else. But you start getting the benefit of using the containers with this option. Your production environments and your dev environments are very similar. You don't run into issues of class not found because you are using containers for each and every specific workloads. So you certainly start getting the benefits of repeatability of your pipeline more when you use, uh, start using containers. So to overcome the challenges of writing your own orchestrator for containers, you will start moving your workloads to Kubernetes. And you will start to, in extent that, your resource management aspects, specifically when it comes to these engines I explained, uh, is to uh, that engine specific. For example, Spark comes up with its own resource manager. Rather than using Kubernetes as a resource manager, you use Spark just deployed on Kubernetes in some form of a deployment and, uh, uh, and some config maps mounted to it. As small as that, you can run your Spark using the Spark uh, resource manager, not using the Kubernetes resource manager. But eventually, you will realize that it's more beneficial to use Kubernetes as its uh, resource manager so that you can scale your applications using Kubernetes, which is not just running your one type of workload, but different types of workload. And the workload can be properly balanced uh, using the Kubernetes as a resource manager. The sixth operation, uh, option which started evolving is working with Kubernetes for the new developers uh, uh, certainly has not been very easy. You have to uh, design your application. And when, when I see application, it has different aspects to it. It will have a deployment. It will have secrets. It will have config maps. It will have PV and PVC. So you need. Uh, to run an application, all these different types of Kubernetes resources need to be spun up. And in order to do it easily, uh, operator pattern has been evolved. So you will start using uh, operators. So all these engines I talk about, Flink provides its own operator, Spark provides its own operator, so that you, when you interact with these engines, you define your application as a resource. And that operator takes care of all these different Kubernetes resources required for you. So there is one more option which has evolved over time is using Knative, uh, specifically for the new developers who are not very well familiarized with the uh, concepts of the Kubernetes. They know their business well. They know how a Spark or a Hive or a Flink application works but they are looking for a serverless model to run. Uh, they cannot go to function as a service because of the limitations in terms of the resources it offers, but they are looking for a combined uh, use cases. This is where Knative comes into picture, which helps you to deploy your application workloads and get the benefit of the serverless, and you will just you not di directly deal with the concepts of Kubernetes there, you will directly start using uh, your applications in form of functions, uh, jobs, uh, uh, and Helm charts directly. So it's a merger of Kubernetes and a function as a service coming together, offering you a serverless kind of experience for your applications. So this is how the journey has been for an AIML pipeline, from running it on-prem on a cluster to running it as a serverless offering. So let's explore different types of design patterns which have evolved over a period of time in the domain of security, uh, in terms of uh, your CI, CD, uh, in, uh, some behavioral and functional patterns uh, which I would like to share, uh, and also some uh, patterns in term, uh, for networking and monitoring and logging. So, uh, so just a disclaimer, it's not a complete list of patterns. Uh, I'm just going to talk about, I've categorized into these categories. Some patterns are reusable to different uh, domains. Uh, just wanted to give you a list so that you can explore and adopt, not just for your AIML, 
but for other pipelines which you may have. So when it comes to security, uh, first pattern which we also have multiple talks is to use, start using a service mesh. Primarily where you don't need to write code to do certain things uh, and this service mesh start offering you out of the box. Some things like SSL termination, uh, some out of the box monitoring aspects, all of that benefits which comes with Eastview and its equivalents is to start using a service mesh. One thing which I want to add the caution, everybody when they start their journey on Kubernetes is uh, the out of the box Kubernetes cluster is pretty flat. It's pretty open. You should start putting your boundaries to restrict its usage. If you're planning to use it for multiple teams, uh, rather than uh, relying on them to use it optimally, you should start putting those boundaries uh, by having RBACs properly defined, by having the network policies uh, properly defined, uh, by having the resource isolation constraints properly defined. There are ways and means to achieve that, and we have templatized it in a way that you can start as soon as your Kubernetes cluster comes up, deploy these as templates so that anybody using it do not get the complete access uh, out of the box. And uh, last thing in terms of security here is uh, when you work with your secrets, uh, don't deploy them directly in a form of a YML. Have your vault to your secret integration in place. All the cloud providers have integrations with vault, which is very limited to access. So all your secrets are stored in vault. And your Kubernetes secrets can be directly created from that vault rather than having in form of a YML file, uh, which could leak those secrets out, uh, which are not supposed to be read by a few people, either who are deploying it or, 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 who, or who just have a read-only access to your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so the next set of patterns which you have seen evolving is in you know, CI-CD uh, pipeline. Uh, one pattern which I would highly recommend is to do your live image scans. Uh, as the adoption is growing, all our images are highly, highly vulnerable. There are new vulnerabilities being detected. You should have a separate secure pipeline running which should detect those problems which should notify uh, for any vulnerabilities and uh, create tickets for your dev team to start fixing them and the same pipeline to start deploying the fixes in an automated fashion to your uh, production clusters. So there also you take uh, different design patterns to deploy based on the strategy you want to follow. There are patterns like you can do a canary based deployment or you can do a blue-green deployment where you form a new cluster and start prepare that new cluster with the upgraded version of both Kubernetes as well as your application and do a, a, a shift of your workloads through your load balancers to the new cluster and discard the old cluster. That is one option. Or you follow the canary way of deployment where a few percentage of your workload goes to, uh, let's say 2% or 3% of the new workload goes to the updated version and everything is working fine, then you move your entire workload to that. Other thing uh, which I would highly recommend is to uh, use the latest versions of the Kubernetes. You keep upgrading your Kubernetes cluster. Don't be stuck to an older version because Kubernetes itself uh, is getting a lot of CVs or the security vulnerabilities which are getting fixed, not just the feature benefits. So it's very much uh, uh, recommended to have a pipeline in a place which takes care of these upgrades. Every upgrade will uh, cost you in terms of the resources. So you should have a very strong pipeline in place which takes care of these upgrades for you. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, there are many uh, recommendations to start with, to start using Knative. Uh, so that rather than building your uh, uh, solution out of the, uh, yourself, you can start reaping the benefits which Knative provides around uh, auto-scaling. 
like you can if your usage is uh, like that you want to just use uh, for, for certain hours of a day no it's not uh, used utilize 100% of the time you are using your kubernetes cluster for certain workloads uh, for just few hours you can certainly deploy it using k native which will make sure it scales down to zero when it is not getting used and it's automatically scales up based on your requirement as soon as your workload hits that endpoint it will start scaling the your application and uh, and you will start reaping uh, the benefits out of it and one moment that workload is finished it will automatically scales down to zero so that really saves cost it makes room for uh, other applications to run uh, rather than you doing it yourself you should use uh, this uh, strategies offered by k native you should also look for um, using a caching solution uh, there is a product called alexio primarily all this aiml pipeline will be reading their data from object storage that's been the common persistent store and before rather than directly reading data from a object storage you should have a in memory cache layer prepared on your uh, kubernetes cluster so that your data stays in memory for your uh, quick and fast access and you can certainly use a uh, product like alexio to achieve that uh, another tuning which i would highly recommend is on your configs tuning have your limits in a way that you you are not over utilizing cpu or you are not doing the cpu throttling uh, where two containers in a same uh, application start competing for the resources with each other uh, so you should be very cautious about that so when it comes to networking uh, it really depends upon organization to organization how they want to uh, uh, network their solution my recommendation is even if you are going with a separate kubernetes clusters or same kubernetes clusters try to have a, a virtual cloud network in place which gives you a set of private subnets to be used uh, which could either be attached in form of a private endpoint or direct vnic attachment uh, so go with your virtual cloud network from a cloud vendor go with your private subnets and the access is limit to do to that network you open access using your egress or ingress rules so that there is no internet uh, in the morning uh, uh, the, uh, 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 lakshmi narayan was mentioning that uh, when he, it was a surprise to him that when he provisioned a new uh, vm there was no internet so it's rather a good thing rather than a bad thing because your access to internet can be enabled rather than having uh, outbound access out of the box uh, you should block uh, everything out of the box and start opening up for only the required things through your egress or ingress policies in place so there are some behavioral patterns also which we have seen uh, kubernetes uh, out of the box provide multiple different types of resources you can also define your own custom resources for this behavioral pattern uh, specifically to do certain let's say uh, jobs if you have a requirement you want to take a data backup at a certain interval if you want to uh, do a certain checks at in place of time the cron job resource is a very good pattern a stateful set pattern which is basically your uh, data and your compute needs to be co-located in terms of things like a database or h base a uh, stateful application really make sure that your data and applications are co-located on a same kubernetes worker node rather than being spread across and this queue pattern where you will have a requirement that you want to uh, decouple your components uh, from the system uh, like a pub sub kind of a model if you're looking for you can use your own custom resources to achieve that pattern or use some of these out of the box resources provided by kubernetes uh, to achieve your use cases so from the functional aspects of it uh, this composition of containers is really the pain i have seen uh, for using kubernetes for so many years 
uh, it has, so the problem which I've been trying to uh, resolve, uh, uh, resolve which this composition of containers really helped is like, we were looking for a carrier, a container as a carrier for ge getting my libraries, getting my applications, not any process, just a carrier. But I don't want to bundle that container with my process image because my carrier can change independently and my process should run independently. So this is where this composition of containers started really helping, where in a same uh, deployment, I could use multiple containers and mount uh, another container's file system as a read-only file system which does not have any process, and my process container is separate, which will read that another container as a file system. So this was not pr basically previously allowed from Kubernetes version 1.117. Uh, this is allowed that you can uh, leverage a container file system and just mount it, and that image can be coming as separate. So this really opens up to many different use cases. One is this container image as a carrier, and you should start composing more containers rather than putting everything inside a single image. Other patterns have also evolved like a sidecar injector pattern, which is a very popular pattern for multiple use cases. Some people use it for monitoring, some people use it for logging, some people use it for uh, even uh, injecting a new container just to monitor on demand. So you don't give access to your main container. It's a special role created. And that container comes at a runtime and gets injected to your main container for the live debugging. And as soon as your debugging is done, this container can be discarded. There are other patterns which we have learned for offering, let's say, Kafka and Flink and Spark, uh, which are primarily coming from uh, derivative of the operator pattern. Uh, and uh, with the operator pattern, we are coming up with this leader election pattern or uh, scatter and gather pattern. So storage is a very wide topic for managing your pipelines. A few recommendations uh, which I would like to share is on the right uses of object storage. Uh, there are multiple ways to use object storage when it comes to these engines. You can directly access the object storage through APIs rather than mounting it. But there have been the many specific use cases where object storage itself needs to be mounted as a POSIX file system. Although it's not recommended, but there have been use cases to mount it as a POSIX file system. And you should be a little cautious while doing that uh, because uh, object storage will not have the uh, permissions in place which your POSIX file system will be looking for. So you should use a uh, init container here to define those permissions to your files so that your files get the right permissions before it goes to the main container. So those are the few patterns which have evolved. Uh, caching we have already discussed using Alexio. Uh, highly recommended for uh, reading large volume of data. And the usage of the scratch space. So many of these runtimes like Spark, Flink, uh, Hive have this requirement that uh, you need to have a local storage available to them, which is used as a temporary file system, uh, which just goes for a few, uh, some time. And the recommendation here is to use MTDIR in Kubernetes for defining these temp stores rather than mounting it on an NFS or uh, even block volumes, because this should be a very fast access. Uh, so you should use MTDIF for your scratch space. When it comes to logging and monitoring, many solutions are already existing, and many are leveraging uh, sidecar containers like uh, FluentD, uh, which shares a, uh, your log volume uh, from your main container, and you define your configurations in FluentD to start pushing your logs to uh, either a logging service or a permanent store. So one gotcha here is, which I have seen multiple customers doing, is they don't define their uh, logging policies well. 
They don't use log4j for log rotation. They don't use, uh, 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 have the log rollover policies defined. And they see, start to see some other side effects because of that. Because of that, their container file system start getting filled up, or their host file system start getting filled up. And they see their main processes getting either hung or stuck. Uh, and this, that is coming because of your logs are filling up your container file system or your host file system. So have those policies in place. Uh, turn on your audit logs to see who is accessing your runtimes and at what time uh, so that all the events are captured. So for monitoring, um, we have already discussed about the strategies. One thing which I would like to highlight here is out of the box, uh, you have access in a way that your pod can access your Cube API server to spin up other pods. So you should disable that. You should have monitoring in place that this should not be enabled. Uh, this should be controlled through RBACs, and you should disable those flags so that your pods cannot make Cube API calls to spin up another containers. So to summarize, uh, there are many, many patterns which are available. They are evolving over a period of time. Uh, there are many books which are coming up uh, for these patterns, but not all patterns are suitable for your use cases. You have to start using multiple patterns to form them together to solve uh, uh, your use cases. So I would I also recommend to try out some of the services being offered by Oracle. If you are looking for uh, intelligent data lake offering uh, or our big data service offering or our managed offerings in terms of Flink and Spark, you should certainly give it a try. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much.